This talk is about security analysis of Calta DIBG, a national standard of random number generator. I'm Viet Tung Huang, and it's joint work with Yavin Shen. As I mentioned earlier, Calta DIBG is a random number generator, or RNG for short. Syntactically, an RNG is a stateful algorithm that keeps refreshing its state via inputs of high mean entropy and provides pseudo random outputs upon request. The RNG that we'll discuss today is Counter DRBG, which is the most popular standardized RNG. It has been used in numerous cryptographic libraries and operating systems, such as OpenSSL or Windows 10. The security of these systems crucially depends on Kata DRBG. Despite the importance of Kata DRBG, for a long time, there have been very few papers on analyzing this scheme. These limited analyses, however, consider just some simplified component of Kata DRBG and therefore cannot support security claims in these documents. In 2019, Woodard and Schumel point out that some options in the openly flexible specification of Calter DRBG might be exploitable. Shortly after, their theoretical observation is confirmed by the work of Carney et al. The latter give a side channel attack on real-world implementation of Calter DRBG. The lessons learned from these two papers are First, you should deprecate insecure options in Kata DIBG. Next, if you are a developer, you should be mindful of misuses such as uh, using leaky table-based AES or failure to refresh the state periodically or using low entropy input. Still, that remains a big question. That if we adopt all of these recommendations, is counter DRBG secure? Our work gives an affirmative answer for this question. Before we get into the technical details, let's define what we mean by security. Our target is the robust notion of notice at all, which is a standard guru of RNGs. Informally, an ING should still provide security, even in the face of state compromise or adversarial input. In particular, we will consider a pair of adversaries, A and D. The sampler D would generate uh, the inputs. The adversary A would try to compromise the state and also distinguish the outputs with truly random strings. If the ING is based on an ideal primitive pi, we will give A oracle access to pi. The sampler D, however, doesn't have access to pi. In other words, the ING has a huge seed, namely the encoding of the ideal primitive pi. In addition to pi, the adversary is also given other oracles. For example, it can get the state of the RNG, or it can set the state of the RNG to a value it lies, or it can force the RNG to refresh the state. The adversary, however, doesn't control the random inputs. Finally, adversary A is also given a real or random oracle that provides either the real outputs of the RNG or random strings of the same length. This oracle, however, would provide real outputs if not enough mean entropy is supplied from a last state compromise. We define the advantage of the adversaries A and D as a normalized probability that A can guess correctly whether it will receive real outputs of the ING or the random strings. Let me now give you a bird eye view of counter DRBG. This construction is based on a randomness extractor that we call condense, then encrypt 
or CTE. Counter the ABC consists of three algorithms, one to derive the initial state, the other one to refresh the state, and yet another one to generate outputs. The state of counter the ABC consists of a key K and an IPV for AES. For example, if you want to derive the initial state from a input I, we will apply CTE on I. We will then use counter mode under a zero key and a zero IV to encrypt the extracted string. The resulting cell text would then be passed into K and V accordingly. If you want to generate an output, we'll use the counter mode to encrypt a zero string under the key K and IVV from the stack. The resulting output would be passed into an output R and an updated state K and V accordingly. Our result bows the robustness advantage of counter DIBG via two terms. The first term measures pseudorandomness quality of outputs produced by counter mode. The second term measures how well we extract randomness from CTE. Here's our bound for the pseudorandomness quality of outputs produced by counter mode. In particular, because we'll use counter on many keys, so the first term bounds the multi-user PRF advantage of counter mode, and the second term bounds the advantage of guessing one of the Q counter keys via at most Q attempts. To bow the quality of extracting randomness from CTE, we'll use the generalized leftover hash lemma from Barak et al. In particular, if a random input has lambda base of conditional mean entropy given other inputs, we recommend that lambda to be at least 216. For the rest of the talk, I will elaborate more on randomness extraction in counter DRBG, namely the CTE construction. So this picture is a blueprint of CTE. In particular, given an input I, it will add some prefix free encoding and a padding. It then iterates through CVC mark up to three times with uh, different constant IVs. The resulting cell tag is then passed into a key and an IV of AES. We will use this key and IV to encrypt a zero string under the CVC mode and the cell deck is the extracted output string. As mentioned earlier, CTE is based on CBC map as a building block. Conventionally, CBC map uses the zero IV, but in CTE, the IV is non-zero. A classical guide for using CBC map as a randomness extractor comes from the work of Doris et al. In particular, if you want pseudorandom outputs, each input should have high conditional mean entropy given the past inputs. This recommendation is, however, violated in CTE. In particular, CTE uses CPC map on essentially the same input multiple times. It is one of the biggest challenges in analyzing security of CTE as a randomness extractor. To get around this obstacle, we realized that the outputs of CTE will be used to rewrite a key K and an IVV for the counter mode. Therefore, if we model AES as an ideal cipher, these outputs only need to be unpredictable instead of being pseudo-random. As a result, we can circumvent the requirements in the classic work of Notice et al. As an added plus, because we only need the outputs of CTE to be merely unpredictable, we can reduce the mean entropy requirement from 280 bits to 216 bits. 
before we analyze the unpredictability of city outputs, let's define an unpredictability notion for a key hash function H. In this game, we first sample a random input I of random bits of mean entropy. We then generate a key K uniformly at random, independent of I. We then hash I under the key K to produce an output Z. We then define the guessing advantage of an adversary A against H via Q queries as the probability that A can guess Z via Q guesses. Analyzing the unpredictability of CTE is rather tricky. Let's begin with an intuitive approach. In particular, we will first show that CPC Mac is an almost universal AU hash function. That is, if we pick two distinct strings X and Y and sample a uniformly random permutation pi. Then, if we hash X and Y under CPC Mac of pi, then this is unlikely to result in a collision. Next, we will employ the generalized leftover hash lemma of product at all, which essentially says that any good AU's hash function is also a good randomness extractor for unpredictability applications. As I mentioned earlier, we want the collision probability of CPC Mac to be small, but how small is enough? If we use the classic analysis in the work of Notice et al., it gives a good collision bound, but only for X and Y of the same length. If we use this analysis in the context of CTE, it means that we are effectively assuming that the length of its random input is linked to the adversary A before it makes guesses. Because the length is a part of the entropy of inputs, so it means that we are wasting entropy of random inputs and it is undesirable. Alternatively, we can use the analysis in the work of Molari, Pizek, and Rahway, or Cha and Nandi. These analyses can handle arbitrary x and y, but the resulting bound is inferior for our purpose. Let's now try to find a different way to give an unpredictability bound for CTE. As shown in this picture, the output of CTE is the ciphertext of CBC encryption. In order to predict this ciphertext, one needs to guess both the key and the IV of CBC. In our failed attempt, we only require the adversary to predict the key, and as a result, the bound is poor. We now can have a better bound if we require the adversary to guess both the key and IV of CBC. Realizing this observation translates to a multi-collision property of CBC Mac. In particular, we need to show that if we pick two distinct strings X and Y, and then sample a random permutation pi, then if we hash X and Y under CBC Mac of pi, with uh, different IVs 0 and IV1, then the chance that we have a double collision is small. In our work, we can show that the chance of this multi-collision is at most 64 L cubed over 2 to the 256, where L is the maximum block length of X and Y. This multi-collision property then implies that it is hard to predict both the key and IV of CBC encryption inside CTE. As a result, CTE is a good AU hash function. We can prove that without squandering entropy of random inputs. Finally, we will employ the generalized leftover hash lemma to show that CTE is a good randomness extractor for unpredictability applications.
It is the bow for the guessing advantage of an adversary A against city E for Q guesses. In conclusion, our work shows that if you adopt the recommendations in the work of Buddha and Shumel and Connie et al., then counter Diabuchi is robust. Moreover, our work also sheds some light in the design of counter Diabuchi. In particular, this construction looks quite cumbersome at first. However, underneath that, it contains very neat design ideas for getting around the limitation of using CBC map to extract randomness.